Greetings, folks. It's Professor Fiore. Today, we're going to be talking about loudspeakers. Yay! So here's a little loudspeaker. Little bookshelf guy. I'm pull the front off of this. Take a look at what's inside. All right, so this is fairly typical. This is a small bookshelf two-way loudspeaker, and we have two, two uh, drivers, two transducers in here, a low-frequency driver, also known as a woofer, high-frequency driver, also known as a tweeter. You might have a three-way system with a mid-range. In the old days, they used to call those squawkers. This is a sealed box. You might have a system where there's a, a hole in it, a port or a vent. We'll talk about that in another video. The first question that might come to mind is, why are there multiples? Well, the reason there are multiples is because there's three things to consider for your loudspeaker, for any given transducer. And that is the overall volume it can produce, the frequency range it can produce, and what the level of distortion is. It's, with present technology, really difficult to get all three at the same time. So we basically pick two of them. In other words, you can make a single transducer that will cover the entire frequency range and do it with low distortion, but it won't be very loud. Or you can make something that will be loud and low distortion, but it won't cover the entire frequency range. So that's typically what we're faced with. We want something loud enough and we want something that's low distortion. So we have to split up the audio audible spectrum into different ranges and we make loudspeakers that are sort of uh, design skewed for that particular range. All right, so let's just take a look at a sort of a generic low frequency loudspeaker. All right, so this is a little eight inch device that we have here, uh, similar to the one in the loudspeaker box. There is a strong interaction between the woofer, the low frequency driver, and the box that it's in. Again, we're going to take a look at that in another video. But Externally, what do we notice, right? Besides the fact this thing has a stamped metal frame, uh, a higher quality loudspeaker will have a cast metal frame because it's, it's not going to vibrate as much, stiffer. We have a cone, a surround that attaches the cone to the frame, and a magnet. A couple of connections back here to connect the wires, all right? And essentially, you know, if you've ever looked at one of these things in operation, you know, this thing sort of pulses in and out in accordance with the audio signal, all right? Now, these things come in a lot of different sizes. So you might have, you know, a little four inch, like this guy, okay? A little four inch base driver. So this goes into a little mini monitor. Um, notice that the magnet on this thing is actually bigger than the magnet on this guy. And by the way, bigger magnet doesn't automatically mean better. Um, on the other extreme, we could be looking at high frequencies, in which case we're talking about the tweeters. So here are some little tweeters, all right? You'll notice that the backs on these things are fully sealed so that the backwash, the back pressure from the woofer doesn't in any way modulate the motion of this cone. So these things have very small cones very small diaphragms. They're light so that they can move very rapidly for the high frequencies. A step up from that would be a dome tweeter. So this uses a sort of a fabric, a, a silk fabric that's impregnated to uh, make it stiff. And again, pretty good size magnet considering the size of, of that diaphragm. Now, all of these devices basically work on the same principle even though the, the shape of the diaphragm and the size is considerably different, they all work on the same principle. Um, by comparison, you could have something like this. This is a piezoelectric tweeter. If you pull the back off on this, you would also see a diaphragm that comes up to this little horn. And the horn is used to properly couple, it's an acoustic impedance coupling, between that diaphragm and the surrounding air. Horns are very efficient compared to uh, direct radiating cone drivers. Um, you know, maybe by a factor of 10. The downside is 
the size of this cone is wavelength uh, size, wavelength associated. So for really low frequencies, you know, at 100 hertz, the wavelength is about 10 feet, you know, about three meters. Um, those are pretty big horns. So you typically don't see those. You certainly don't see that in, in any kind of home thing. But, you know, this is just a little tweeter. So the, the physical size of the horn, which also helps direct the sound, controls the directivity, um, can be modest. Uh, something a little bit more complicated than that would be this little exponential horn. So again, the driver is back here. If you took this all apart, again, there'd be a little um, coil element back there uh, pushing on a diaphragm. And again, it comes out through the horn, very high efficiency. Now, the little piezo device doesn't use the standard um, arrangement we're going to look at in a second. This uses piezoelectric effect. So the actuation of the diaphragm is a little bit different. But nonetheless, so here's a fairly old loudspeaker that I sort of sacrificed. Um, basically, I cut away the surround on this thing, and you can pull the diaphragm off. All right, so here we have, you can see very nicely, the magnetic gap. All right, so this is just a little concentric. Uh, little circle here. And then here's the back side of the diaphragm. This little orangey kind of thing is called a spider, and this attaches to the frame back here. And the important bit is this more reddish thing. That's the voice coil. So this is a fine coil of wire that wraps around a former that typically would be something like aluminum, and that fits inside the gap. So another view of this all right, we took the twin of this guy and literally sawed it in half. And this is what you wind up with, okay? So here's that thing cut in half. So um, in the back is the magnet, and you can pull this apart, right? So here's the actual ceramic magnet right here. And then there's a little pull piece in the back that kind of holds things together. But the cone also nicely cut in half. You can see this, right? So we have the surround out here. Here's the spider again, right? That's going to attach to the frame. And here's the voice coil, also cut in half with that fine magnet wire that's going to sit inside. So this one, you can maybe get a better idea of how this whole thing fits together, right? So you can see here's the spider connecting it. You got the uh, suspension on the top part, a little dust cap, this white dust cap to keep dust out and seal this, right? The inside and the outside of the box. And then the, the coil itself sits inside that magnetic gap. Remember the, the magnet was down here with that pole piece that went up inside, okay? All right, so that's the basic construction of it. In the, um, in the semiconductor textbook, there's actually a really nice, uh, cutaway diagram of a loudspeaker like this in full color. Okay, so you got this coil of wire. How does this whole thing work in association with a magnet? Well, if you've seen the video on um, Faraday's law and uh, electric guitar pickups, it uses the same idea. Faraday's law basically says if you have a conductor, you got a wire, and it's cutting lines of magnetic force, in other words, a magnetic field, if it's cutting those, you can induce a voltage in that wire. And the faster this thing cuts the wire, the bigger the voltage is. So the motion of the, of the wire in the magnetic field reflects, or is reflected, I should say, in terms of the resulting voltage. So whatever that thing is doing, that's what you get for a voltage. It also works in reverse. You know, this principle is the same thing that we use for... Um, motors and generators, all right? But this, this principle works for loudspeakers. It also works for dynamic microphones, which we'll talk about in another video. But basically what ends up happening is you have this fixed magnetic field. And when you take this guy, right? And you connect this up to an amplifier, there's a current going through this coil of wire. And what does that do? Well, it basically creates its own magnetic field. You know, it's, it's an electromagnet, basically. And 
depending on the polarity of that current, that'll tell you what the polarity of the magnetic field is. In other words, is north over here or is north over here, right? Is it north-south or is it north-south like this, okay? That interacts with the fixed magnet, in other words, this guy, right, which is which was sitting back here. And, you know, if you ever played with a magnet, you know that depending on how you orient the magnet, the two magnets will either come together, right, they'll attract or they'll push apart, they'll repel. The same thing happens here. So you've got this fixed magnet and you've essentially got an electromagnet, which is controlled by the audio signal. So sometimes it repels and it goes out, it pulses out, and sometimes they attract and they pulse in, right? So it goes back and forth like this and it pushes against the air and bingo, you got yourself some sound, all right? Now, for a prop appropriate design on this, you wanna make a cone that is very stiff, rigid, right? You don't want it to flex, but you don't want it to have any resonance either. You don't want this thing to ring on its own. So if you're thinking in terms of something that's light and stiff, you might think of certain metals like aluminum. Problem with aluminum would be, you know, you tink it, right? You go like this and it, it rings. It has a natural resonant frequency. So you're looking for something that has uh, what we call a, an appropriate Young's modulus, internal damping. Felted paper works pretty good for that. It's light, you know, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't ring, so to speak. You hit it, it just goes thunk. That's what you want. There are other materials you can use. You can use certain kinds of plastics. Um, you can make metal sandwiches. So you might have a, a, a metal uh, skin, so to speak, and maybe an expanded foam core, and that would essentially damp any, any resonance inside the metal skin. Uh, Kevlar is another possibility, but again, you want something that's very light and uh, and stiff because if this thing starts distorting, then it's changing the way it's interacting with the air, and that's just a form of distortion. Now, the other obvious thing that you noticed, right, is this this size difference between you know this woofer and this tweeter. Okay, there's a bunch of things going on here. It turns out the volume of one of these loudspeakers is a function of something we call volume velocity, which is basically, you can visualize this as how much air this thing, this cone is sweeping out in time. Now, if you have a low frequency, right, it's moving relatively slow compared to a high frequency. So to get the same volume of air that it's pushing over a period, like one second, you either have to make a larger surface area or accept the fact that the cone has to move farther, right? So if I had two cones that were the same diameter, one was gonna reproduce high frequencies and one was gonna reproduce low frequencies to get the same volume level, the low frequency thing is gonna to have to move really far. Well, that's, guess what? That's a possible source of distortion. You know, there's linearity as far as the uh, motion of the surround and the spider, that's an issue. You know, these things can't move inches, you know, not with any kind of uh, low distortion. You know, typical loudspeakers, bass drivers, for low distortion, you're probably only looking at a few millimeters of motion. Now, serious, you know, PA level, you know, public address system level uh, loudspeakers, you might be talking about a 15 or an 18 inch uh, bass driver. Yeah, that might move half an inch or an inch. You know, you might get 25 millimeters of travel out of that thing, a parameter we call X max, the maximum excursion. Um, but, you know, if you're home loudspeaker, eh, not so much. So, you know, one of the compensations we use, obviously, is to make a larger diaphragm, right? Why have it move really far if I can just make it larger? Of course, the downside of making it larger, you solve one problem and you get another, right? The downside is you got a bigger cone. It's more massive. It's harder to move quickly. You know, small things can move very fast. Big, heavy things, not so fast. So, you know, we have a little bit of an issue there. Um, and these would be kind of, you know, typical sorts of solutions that you would see in a, in a home loudspeaker. Six, eight inch uh, woofer, maybe a 10 inch woofer in, you know, a little cone tweeter like this, couple inches or, or the dome tweeter that we saw earlier, you know, sort of a step up. But again, you know, this is only maybe like three quarters of an inch, right? You might, you're only looking at maybe a 15 millimeter dome, something like that. Okay. Um, and you know, you might, like I said, have a three-way. So you might have a 10-inch uh, a bass driver and maybe a four-inch mid-range and a 
three quarter inch dome tweeter or something like that. All right. And they all have to be connected through some kind of crossover network, which was just um, a resistor inductor capacitor network, right? An electronic network that divides the frequencies. It basically is there to sort of shunt the frequencies to the appropriate driver. You don't want to put really high frequencies in this. It can't reproduce them well. It just creates extra heat and distortion. You don't want to put really low frequencies into a little tweeter like this because that's going to produce huge distortion. You'll probably blow this thing up, right? So a, a crossover frequency, it depends on how big these things are and what the design is, but um, you know, in a professional PA, the crossover frequency might be for a two-way system, you know, might be 800 hertz. In a home stereo, it might be a few kilohertz. You know, we're looking at different kinds of things, right? You have a very large home uh, ho home system, or maybe a car system. Okay, you could have 10, 12, 15 inch drivers. All right, big software. The subwoofer might be you know 18 inch. All right, which is not to say you can't get a lot of bass, low frequency uh, information out of you know an eight or 10 but you know with a 15 let's say or a 12 that cone doesn't have to move as far and potentially keyword here is potentially it will produce lower distortion because it doesn't have to move as far all right so you know these individual transducers um you know depending uh you might be looking at 10 watts you know 20 watts 50 watts something like that like this little stamped frame guy is uh eight watts right that's continuous. You know, when you set up your loud, loudspeaker system at home with your stereo, you have a 100 watt stereo. It's not always pumping out 100 watts. You know, at, at conversation level, it may only be pumping out a, a watt or two. And that's going to get split between this woofer and the little tweeter. Tweeter may only handle a couple of watts. At a pro level, you're talking about really high power stuff, right? We ta start talking about horns where the driver itself. Right, just this piece of it might weigh 25 pounds, okay, and it's got a two inch diameter throat, and you know, the horn can be really quite big. You know, you could be looking at, at devices that withstand 100, 200 watts continuous and will produce you know, deafeningly loud sound pressure levels in your home. You wouldn't use them in your home, it's just, it's just too much, right? Um, so we've got a pretty wide range here, right, of, of different kinds of devices, but all of these things operate on this basic idea of having a coil of wire suspended in a magnetic gap. We throw a current in there, produces its own magnetic field, which interacts with the fixed magnetic field, and that creates motion. The motion, basically, you're pushing against the air, that sets up an acoustic pressure wave, bingo! We have sound. The devil is in the details, as they say. So one of the things we want to look at is how does the box, right? How does the enclosure, this thing, how does that affect the sound? Turns out there's a huge interaction between this and that bass driver. And we'll talk about that in another video. See you then.